So the model is, is, is a, that I want to take you through. Um, is, uh, this is the Econometric Society presidential lecture. So we're going to make sure we do a, a, a technical exercise. Uh, the, the model is an uh, extension of the Becker-Stigler model to uh, control a magistrate or a governor. Um, I've got all the, the, the typical example and all the parameters I need to tell you about are at the top row along with uh, the uh, second row, along with typical values that will turn up in some a numerical example. Uh, so at any time, a governor is out there in the province and he can behave well, she can behave well, or she can misbehave, which is like being a little corrupt, or she can outright re rebel. I'll call it rebel. It could be trying to make the province an independent country, or we could call it uh, looting the province and, uh, and running away with her family with as much as she could loot after uh, uh, a, few, a few weeks of, uh, of, 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 of stealing from people. Uh, but uh, whatever it is, uh, I want to say there are these three alternatives. The difference between behaving well and misbehaving, the prince cannot observe. Uh, rebellion is public. But, uh, so the prince can observe costly crises that occur at a uh, random rate. It'll be a Poisson process, which has a higher rate, a low rate, alpha, uh, if, uh, if, the prince, if the governor is behaving well. But it has a higher rate, beta, bad beta for bad. If, uh, if, she, if the governor is misbehaving, if she's being corrupt, Poisson process means that in any very short time interval length epsilon, there's a beta epsilon of probability of a crisis if she's misbehaving in that time interval. And if she's behaving well, it's only an alpha epsilon. Beta is bigger than alpha. One important way that this model is going to differ from most of the previous ones is going to be that alpha is strictly positive. So even if she's, a, if she's behaving appropriately, crises still occur, which means that if we punish crises, Governors are being punished even when they're on the equilibrium path behaving well. Open rebellion gives a, a present, that present value of D to the governor. I'm going to assume risk neutrality and everybody has the same discount factor. If I want to talk about present values and flows, delta. I should say, oh, misbehavior. Uh, the governor takes corrupt hidden benefits that are worth gamma per unit time. That's a flow. Uh, actually, I think I'd like to interpret that when we get to, later, we'll talk about Janusz Kornai's the soft budget constraint. So maybe it's worth thinking about the, the misbehavior as being misallocating a certain maintenance budget. That is to say, the state is going to have to pay a certain amount of money to uh, administer the province, and the governor can even either spend it or misappropriate it to her private uh, consumption, uh, and there's a flow of gamma in this budget. Um, but in the corrupt, we can't see her as being taken. The, she, she's, the, the, resource, the gamma flow is going somewhere. The question is, is it, going to, is it being well used or or stolen. This, another way that this model is different from previous ones is I'm going to assume that candidates for governor have uh, people who are not governor but could be go become governor after we, if you've sacked uh, someone in office, uh, have some resources, I'll call it K, a capital asset amount. Uh, but this amount of K is typically positive, it's non negative, uh, but it's strictly less than the rebellion amount. So I'm, I'm going to assume. Unlike uh, Becker Stigler, I'm assuming they don't have, they, these, these people don't have unlimited resources to post a bond. But unlike Shapiro Stiglitz, I'm going to assume they have some resources to, to, to pay. Uh, I said I really want to talk about the, the problem of trusting the prince and I'm having difficulty with that. There are a variety of technical reasons why, uh, because I guess I want to talk about the relationship of the prince with one governor and really the prince's decision problem depends on his relationship with many governors. So I'd like to just I told you I'm not going to do it adequately. Better papers are needed. I'm going to add a parameter called h, the high, high end. And h is the upper bound of the present discount value of what the prince can be trusted to owe a governor. At any point in time, the prince is going to say, you know, your future relationship with me, I'm going to pay you a lot uh, of, of state benefits. And the present discount value of that is some amount, that amount can't be more than h, because if it was more than h, then, uh, so this, is, this, is, this parameter becomes my representation of the prince's moral hazard problem. And that's not adequate. I'd rather make it a decision problem. But uh, I derive it. But there's reasons why. But I'm going to be able to do comparative statics. By not making endogenous, I can, uh, I can do comparative statics. And that's, that's the advantage of this formulation. The prince's expected cost uh, can be uh, provided. Uh, he, he's got a province. He needs a governor in it at any point in time. Uh, he, uh, we want to minimize the, the prince's expected cost. I'll assume that these crises are just very expensive. At the end of the talk, I'm going to bring the cost down finite and allow the possibility that maybe we might tolerate misbehavior 
Throughout the talk, the print, we have an incentive constraint. The prince never wants a governor to rebel. And for now, let's say the prince also doesn't want the governor to be misbehave. So what's the policy, the incentive plan that will give an incentive for, for governors to always govern well, but minimizes the prince's expected discounted value? Uh, I will say one other thing, the, the governors can, will add that governors can be invited to the prince's court for very short visits, and then the governor can't rebel. But any crisis that occurs, the governor sees it first. So there's a difficulty uh, punishing agents. Uh, so here's, here's a, uh, the, the, I'll show you, the, there's, a, there's a paper that goes with this but doesn't have the discrete time model, and I'll be adding it in the next few weeks. Uh, but I'd like to give, here's, here, describe the discrete time model. It's uh, in, in, in still in rough form, in, not in full written form. The discrete time model is if epsilon, I'm going to take epsilon to zero. Think of epsilon as the length of time of the interval. Uh, and in, in two, another slide or two, it'll go to zero. Uh, you know, here's the story. Say at any one short discrete time interval, first we'll begin with that short visit to court. Uh, the governor could be paid some money, and I'll call the flow rate of the payment y, so epsilon y is the amount that's paid in a period of epsilon length epsilon. Uh, when called to court, you as governor could also be dismissed. So let q be the probability that at the beginning of this period you'll be dismissed if when called to court. If you're dismissed, then the prince will go find somebody else in the street who's got k private assets, <laughs> ask her to pay k and sell, the, uh, sell your office to her. Anyway, if you are not dismissed, which is going to be the usual case, you go back to the province and now, or the new guy goes up, the new one goes up, and the governor then chooses to behave well or misbehave. If you misbehave, you're taking the epsilon gamma a flow of, uh, of, of private benefits or misappropriating the, the maintenance budget. Uh, then observable prices occur in this period with probably epsilon alpha if you behave well, epsilon beta if you misbehave, and then finally you, the governor, can choose to rebel and take D or not. Uh, without loss of generality, I can put the rebellion decision at the end, you'll see. Uh, so at any point in time, as is typical in these dynamic moral hazard models, we can say the governor has some accumulated expected present discounted value that was promised <laughs> dynamically in the past, and that's really the state variable, and I'll call that the governor's credit. So in any one period model, we can recursively describe the, the feasibility constraints. The first one is a promise keeping constraint. Let's see, U is what was promised at the beginning of last period, at the, I'm sorry, at the end of last period, uh, how much was the governor the incumbent governor promised, and her payment, plus if she's not dismissed, let's let R denote what she gets if she, if she, doesn't, if she doesn't rebel. Uh, if, I'm sorry, if she, if, if, there's no, if she doesn't rebel, her future promise will be R if there's no crisis, but there's some penalty pi, R minus pi, if there is a crisis. So uh, the probability R or, or, or R minus pi with the appropriate probabilities, that's it, if she isn't dismissed, plus uh, the epsilon Y, that has to be greater than or equal to the present, the, the current expected value of what was promised epsilon ago at the end of last period. We have non negativity constraints, but the probability of dismissal has to be between zero and one. And I assume <coughs> that the governor doesn't have infinite resources. She paid all the resources she had when she became governor. Uh, there's an incentive constraint that says uh, getting the good outcome is better than, with probability of epsilon alpha is better than taking the absolute gamma but having the penalty of Pose not with epsilon alpha probability, but with epsilon beta probability. And the worst thing that could happen is at the end of the period, she's got the penalty, and that can't make her rebel. This is really important. If you're, for example, the emperor of Rome, and it looks like one of your generals just made a difficulty, and you're now going to need to punish the general, that's when generals rebel, uh, if they rebel, and you have to be very careful. Dismissing people who are powerful is extremely difficult.